So if you know me, you know that I'm a tech geek. And, and what a tech geek means is that uh, I buy a lot of first generation code for spend too much money, uh, t technology equipment, and um, way overpay. And now what it doesn't mean is that I understand a thing about how it works. I mean, I, I know nothing about how technology, how technology works. So uh, I started thinking about this, uh, what you could really call addiction that I have in my life for first generation technology. And started doing my searching fearless moral inventory of that. And I, and I went back to my teenage years, and I remember that in my teenage years, I stood in line and was one of the first buyers of a Casio digital watch. I mean, I mean it was very expensive. And then in my 20s, I stood in line and bought this newfangled thing called a VCR. Yeah. And then uh, a little bit later, bought a DVD. Don't know what they stand for, but I bought them, right? Spent a ton of money on those. And then, um, and then into, into, into my 30s, I bought, uh, I bought a first-generation laptop from Dell Computers. Now, l let me tell you a little story about that computer. Um, it was my first year here. The church I left in Fort Lauderdale, a kind uh, businessman gave me a, a, a very large gift and told me to buy something for my new ministry. And so I knew I needed a brand new laptop computer. It cost $4,000, this Dell computer. Now, this is back in the days, if you're under 30, let me tell you about what it was like when the earth was cooling. Um, uh, you would get a magazine in the mail, and uh, uh, not email, in the mail. You go to the mailbox and you pull it. And you'd open it up, it was a Dell catalog, and then you'd call an 800 number. Back then we had these things, they were on the wall in your home. And you'd call, and, and then somebody on the other side, typically in India, would take your order and then send you in the mail the laptop. And so I got it. It, it weighed about as much as a boat motor, all right? I still got curvature of the spine from carrying that thing around for a couple of years. Now, a good friend of mine here at the church, Marty Wilkinson, um, he, he had this computer program on his computer that allowed you to take um, a fiction amount of money, some money, and put it in and, and buy stock. Now, you're not really doing it. You're just doing it on the program. And so he did that for me, and, and here's what he told me uh, about like three years later. When, by the way, the laptop didn't work anymore, right? Three years later, laptop doesn't work. And he told me, he said, George, if instead of spending the $4,000 on your Dell computer, you had bought $4,000 worth of Dell stock, you know, on the stock exchange. He said, today, instead of having a laptop that doesn't work, you'd have, sit down, he told me, $1 million. True story. True story. Because Dell stock was quadrupling every, you know, couple of months. So you'd think I'd learned my lesson about technology, right? <laughs> but then my 40s came, and it was like the heavens opened. St. Stephen, Apple computers came onto the scene. Oh my gosh, money started flying out of my wallet. I, bought, I stood in line, first generation iPhone, iPhone 2, iPhone 3, iPhone 3S, iPhone 4, iPhone 5S, iPhone 6, iPhone 7, iPhone 8. I've bought them all. I bought an iPad. I've got laptops, desktops. I've had Apple TVs. I've got, I've got Apple earbuds. I've got every Apple product known to humankind. And again, I don't know how it works, but I know they're very expensive. And the thought came to me this week. What if instead of buying all those Apple products, I would bought Apple stock? I'd be a millionaire twice over. Right? But instead, I got a drawer full of stuff. I almost <laughs> said a bad word in church. It doesn't work anymore. Now, um, uh, here's my iPhone 8. And um, every once in a while, my iPhone 8, um, uh, I don't know, somehow, magically, I think it's voodoo, um, this little thing comes up and it tells me that I need to update my phone. It, it tells me I need to do that because there's some glitch in the phone. And then every once in a while it says major update and you have to, you have to do that. Now, here's the deal I've discovered about updates when it comes to my phone or my laptop, my iPad or anything else, is that I can ignore it and the glitch can keep on working. I was thinking about that this week and I thought, wouldn't it be really cool if in our walk with Jesus, that on our soul, God would give us a walk with Jesus update. Now, wouldn't it be cool, wouldn't it be cool if this showed up on your soul? 
Now, you can ignore it, but wouldn't it be cool if, if in your walk with God, God would say, you know, I love you so much, I want to give you an update. Here's what I wrote this week as I was thinking about this. I wish that when my prayers get rote and tame, when my service for God gets mundane and boring, when my Bible reading gets sporadic and lifeless, when my worship gets routine and joyless, that God would put on the screen of my soul, walk with Jesus update. Now, would you agree with me that that would be great? Can you give me a yes? If you think, Yeah, that would be really wonderful. Now, uh, these last four weeks, we've been talking about this issue of faith and what it means to have faith come hell or high water, what it means to have this kind of perseverance, this grit in our walk with God, what it means for us to have a long obedience in the same direction. And, and we've been considering this, and we on Easter we talked about how the focus of our faith, the object of our faith needs to be Jesus. And then we, we talked about how storms in life are going to come. In this life there will be trials and tribulations. And Jesus will either calm the storms around us or he'll calm the storm inside of us. Both are miracles. We learned last week that we need to have a firsthand faith, a faith uh, that is our own, that God doesn't have any grandchildren, God only has children. And today we're going to talk about what it means for us to have an up-to-date faith today. What does it mean for you and I to walk with Jesus and for that walk to be up-to-date right now? Now, we're gonna, we've had two anchor texts that the Bible give to, gives to us about this whole issue of faith, of perseverance, of grit. The first is Hebrews 11.1. 1. We're going to have a little competition in church this morning, and so this side is going to read it, all right? This side over here. Y'all ready over here? You ready over here? This side, give me a yeah. Okay, now let's read this together. Ready, go. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. You see, come hell or high water, we can have confidence and insurance about uh, our walk with God in life. This side, y'all ready over here? Okay, now ready, let's read this verse. Ready, go. For we live by faith and not by sight. I'm just gonna call it a tie, all right? We live by faith, not by what we can see not we can see, that if we're going to have uh, grit in our life, if we're going to have this kind of perseverance, it's not about what we see. I found this this week. I really loved it. Faith hears the inaudible, sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. I'm getting that tattooed somewhere. That's good. You see, um, our faith has to be up to date, but you would agree with me that keeping your faith up to date today is not easy and it's not automatic. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was listening to my best friend, Dale Locke, uh, speak at my seminary, at our seminary, and here's what he said. He said, many of us have an adolescent faith with adult challenges. Isn't that true? I mean, let's be honest. For many of us, our faith is adolescent, but our challenges are very adult challenges. Um, over the 22 years I've been here, here's how I've put it. My version of this is that yesterday's faith is not enough for today's challenge. Yes, yesterday's faith was great for yesterday's challenge, but it won't carry through to today. Faith for yesterday just gets old. We need an up-to-date faith. Many of us in church this morning and listening online, frankly, we're living off the residue of remembered religion. We're living off the residue of what God has done in our past. And what he did in our past is wonderful, but we need a current faith for our current trials and tests. We all need an up-to-date faith. So that's the question we're going to try to answer this morning is how can I have an up-to-date faith? Now let me remind you that faith is like our muscles in our body. If you don't exercise, your muscles begin to atrophy. At the early service, at the 8.30 service, my doctor sings in the choir, which means it really sucks to be me, right? And, uh, and I had to confess to him that I had not been exercising much, and, and uh, so he, you know, he gave me some orders to exercise. So for the last couple of weeks, I've been getting on my bike and riding every couple of days and, and doing many miles. And, and here's the thing I've discovered is I have muscles that I didn't even know exist because they... They're killing me because the problem was that as I would sit at home with the remote control, which this is not exercise, I'm just telling you, uh, your muscles begin to atrophy and that's what happens in our faith because listen to me, many of us have allowed our circumstances to outpace our discipline. Let me say that again. Many of us have allowed our circumstances, come hell or high water, to outpace our disciplines, our practices. And there's some faith practices we're going to talk about this morning 
that can help keep our faith up to date and current for today's challenges, whatever they might be. So how do we answer this question? How can I have an up-to-date faith? What are the practices? Well, number one, if I'm going to have an up-to-date faith, I'm going to need to trust my past to God's grace. Say that with me. Trust my past to God's grace. Have you ever heard somebody say to you, boy, have I got a past? And typically what's behind that is that they've done something in their life that was at least unsavory at best and criminal at worst, okay? Okay. It means that they've got what we call in church, the churchy way of saying it is, I've got a testimony, Pastor. I've got a story to tell you. Well, the Apostle Paul, uh, before he was Paul, uh, he had a testimony. He had a past. He had a story to tell. And he would often tell the story when he was speaking, when he was preaching, about who he used to be. And in his letters, he would write about it. And the best place I've ever found that he wrote about it was Galatians 1, 13 to 16. Here's what Paul writes. He says, you know what I was like in the past when I followed the Jewish religion, how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. That was his past. But even before I was born, God chose me and he called me by his marvelous grace. And then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the outsiders, to the Gentiles. Now, now, if Paul wants to be impressive to these gathering of churches in this region in Asia Minor called Galatia, Galatians, Galatia is not a city, it's a region in Asia Minor where there were these little missionary outposts called churches. And if Paul wanted to impress them, I'm not sure that I would tell that I used to kill people who were just like you. But that's his testimony. That's his story that he used to recreationally persecute Christ followers. But he, he, before he knew Jesus, Paul was a bloodthirsty bounty hunter who persecuted and tortured and imprisoned and, yes, even killed followers of Jesus. But that wasn't the end of Paul's story because Paul, he was wrecked by Jesus. He calls it here his marvelous grace. And Jesus gave him a new purpose and a new mission, and that was to tell people who were outside of what, we believed, what they believed to be God's blessings, outside these Gentiles, See, Paul models for us that our mess, our mess in the past, can become God's message in the present. That God wants to transform our past. You see, Paul did not hold back from his past. He allowed God to redeem it. It was the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God that we just sang about. Now, some of the most tender and sacred work that I do as a pastor is when somebody sits with me across a table with a cup of coffee and they share with me their past, their messes, their testimony. And can I remind you this morning that no matter how holy you think you are today, you got a past and you've got a testimony. Sometimes it's unsavory and sometimes, yes, it's criminal. Some of you know that before I knew Jesus, I I had a very unsavory and, yes, even criminal past. And whenever I go to the Lee County Jail to visit somebody, I always have to remember that the guy or the gal on the other end of that screen, the only difference between them and me is they got caught. All of us have a a story. When we surrender our mess to God's marvelous grace, to his overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, or as Brendan Manning calls it, God's vulgar grace and indiscriminate compassion, God will transform our mess into his message. You see, Paul could have been chained to his failures. He could have allowed the fact that he used to persecute and kill followers of Jesus to wreck his life and keep him from being the person that God made him to be. Here's what I thought of this week. I've been following Jesus for 40 years and never had this thought. It's kind of an up-to-date thought. I have to believe that the Apostle Paul, because the movement of Jesus was still relatively small, he prayed with family members and friends of people that he himself, in his previous life, either imprisoned or sadly even had killed. And he refused even that to keep him from being the person God made him to be. Guilt could have racked and wrecked Paul's life. Can I tell you that I know far too many followers of Jesus who have allowed their past to tether them. 
And they've sequestered themselves in self-imprisonment of guilt and shame over what they've done to others and bitterness and resentment to what others have done to them. And let me just let you know that in no uncertain terms, the only one who wins when you live in that space is the evil one, Satan. Because Jesus came, listen to me, church, to set you free from your past. I love coming on Friday nights. I love coming to celebrate recovery. For 17 years, I can't even imagine tens of thousands of people for the last 17 years have heard stories from this very place, from ordinary men and women who have shared how God in his marvelous grace transformed their mess into his message. I never tire of hearing a, a, a man like my good friend Raul last week who, who shared his story of, of, of sexual integrity and how God has brought him to that place in his life and he stood courageously and confidently in Jesus about how Jesus had taken his mess and made it a message. I never tire of hearing a woman share about how she was racked with guilt and shame and condemnation and self-hate and Jesus took her mess and made it into God's message. So no matter who you are today and no matter, listen to me, no matter what your past has been, if you'll allow his marvelous grace to wreck you like it did Paul, it will become God's message. You need to exercise that. Number two. Number two, if I'm going to have an up-to-date the faith, I'm going to need to trust my present to God's care. Say that with me. Trust my present to God's care. So Cheryl and I live about a mile down this way um, uh, in a little community there. We live on a lake. That is Lee County's code for a retention pond so they can charge me more money. All right? So we, we lived it down the street, and, and just over the last couple of weeks, um, some of the ducks in our, in our little pond have laid eggs, and the, ba the babies have been born. And my grandkids love to go out there, and they love to feed the ducks. And, and what I've noticed is those mama ducks will take care of their babies. And if you try to go after one of those babies, that mama duck, it, she's going to take care of her baby. All right? The Apostle Paul had his confidence in his heavenly father to take care of him. Because remember, this guy who was a killer of the church is now a pillar of the church. He's got this new mission, and his new mission is that he goes out and he shares the love of Jesus all over Asia Minor. And he, just, on three different occasions, the guy that used to be the persecutor is now the persecuted. The guy that used to be the one who hunted Christians down is now a Christ follower himself, and he's being hunted down. And in this reversal of roles, the Apostle Paul talks about how as he went out on these three missionary journeys, it took many, many years on boats and shipwrecks and none other things. Here's what Paul said in Philippians 4, chapter nine, or chapter, verses 19 through 20, about God's capacity to take care of him. Read this with me. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now all glory to God, our Father, forever and ever. Amen. You see, just like a mother duck takes care of her babies, Paul says our heavenly Father has taken care of him. And notice then in that last verse he says, and he will do it for you. If God wants to take care of you, he, he will supply all your needs. I have to wonder, Paul wrote this about 60 AD, 60 AD, 30 years after Jesus uh, had uh, been killed and rose from the dead and, and ascended into heaven. And I have to wonder if, if some follower of Jesus had told Paul about a time when Jesus gathered on a mountainside, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, and he taught about God's willingness, our Heavenly Father's willingness to take care of us. It's Matthew 6, verses 25 through 30. Listen to what Jesus said. That's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food in your body, more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They, they don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. Now read these last lines that Jesus speaks to us. Let's read this together. 
And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? See, Jesus connects our capacity to exercise our faith muscle and trust God to take care of us with the, the level of our faith. He says, why do you have so little faith? Why don't you trust your heavenly father to take care of your needs? Remember, I've said it here before. God says, I'll take care of your needs, not your greeds. Okay? This is not me hoping and praying that I can upgrade from my iPhone 8 to an iPhone 10. All right? That's a greed, not a need. When I think about when I've had to trust God most to take care of me, my mind goes back to the, the early days. Cheryl and I have been married 36 years, the early days of our marriage. We lived in a little 800-square-foot apartment in Wilmore, Kentucky, went to a very expensive liberal arts college and a very expensive seminary. We had the normal needs that everybody had, an old car that barely ran, a little rent, a little food we needed. We were living on uh, ramen noodles and on Saturday, we'd cut up a hot dog in it. It was big time on Saturdays, you know. And you know, those seven and a half years, eight years that we lived in Kentucky, God took care of us. God takes care of his children. He takes care of their needs. And, and the issue is, will we trust him to take care of us right now? Number three. Number three, if I'm going to have an up-to-date faith, I'm going to need to trust God's future. I'm going to have to trust my future, I'm sorry, to God's promise. Say that with me. Trust my future to God's promise. We've talked about the past and the present. Now we want to talk about the future. Will I trust God to keep his promises about my future? And when I'm talking about my future, I want you to listen to me. Listen to me carefully. The mortality rate sits at 100%. I'm talking about death. Are we willing to trust that this life is temporal and that the God who says, I am going to take care of you as you pass from the veil of death, through the veil of death, from this life into the next. Now Paul is an old man in the verse we're going to read here in a second. He's imprisoned, ironic again, that the imprisoner is now imprisoned. Scholars believe that 2 Timothy is the last letter that Paul wrote. In verses four through, uh, chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, verses 6 through 8, he says, As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. He says it matter-of-factly. I have fought the good fight. I finished the race and I've remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me. It's not just for me. It's for all of us who eagerly look forward to his appearing. You see, Paul was ready to die. He was ready to pass through the veil of death. He had no fear. He had complete confidence. He was courageous as he looked at the end of his life. He was ready to trust Jesus in life and, yes, even even in death. So do you have that kind of confidence? Um, I, I love church history, and Charles Wesley, who was the musician side of the Wesley brothers, John was the theologian, and Charles was the songwriter. And Charles had a doctor, and the doctor uh, cared for many of the early Methodists in England. And that doctor said of those early Methodists, you Methodists die well. I want to be that kind of Methodist who lives with an assurance that I am saved today and as I go through the veil of death, whenever that might be, that I am saved then. Um, yesterday afternoon, Cheryl and I watched uh, the beautiful homegoing service of our first lady, Barbara Bush. And all week I've been, been reading these amazing stories about the love affair, 73 years, the love affair between George and Barbara Bush. I mean, she often talked about how they loved to hold hands. Here's a picture of them holding hands. Our president and our first lady. And, and, and as, as I was thinking about that, I, I did some research and I discovered that they met when she was 16 and he was 17 at a Christmas dance. The family tells us that as... Barbara was laboring for breath, getting ready to pass through the veil of death. But she and George were holding hands. 
73 years. When I was a kid, I remember turning on the radio and listening to Ann Murray sing, I put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. When you say yes to Jesus, he grabs hold of your hand and he won't let you go. Even if you try to let him go. Do you have that kind of confidence to face even death? Do you remember earlier when I, I, I read these words? I, I had them put it on the screen for you. I wish that when my prayers get rote and tame and when my service for God gets mundane and boring and when my Bible reading gets sporadic and lifeless, when my worship gets routine and joyless, that God would put on the screen of my soul, walk with Jesus, update. I worked on this message all week. It was a hard message to finish. And as I got to the end of the message, I heard this whisper from the Holy Spirit, please don't think I'm crazy. And I heard the Holy Spirit whisper and say, hey, silly, I have given you a walk with Jesus update. It's called the Holy Spirit. You see, because this book, the Bible teaches that if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've said yes to Jesus' marvelous grace, that the Holy Spirit lives in you, that the same spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. And the Holy Spirit speaks to us and gives us these updates. But just like, just like I have to decide whether I'm going to listen to the update on my phone, I have to decide, am I going to listen to the update in my soul? So it was the week after Easter a bunch of years ago. A friend of mine here at Grace Church gave Cheryl and me a trip to Washington, D.C. to the Shenandoah Valley to spend a, a week at a monastery. And my agreement with him, the only caveat he gave me to paying for the plane tickets and everything, the only caveat he gave is he said, George, you have to go spend one hour with a Roman Catholic monk who is my spiritual director. Now, something inside of me rebelled against that because I kept thinking, I'm a Protestant pastor. I'm married and I got kids. You're a celibate Roman Catholic priest. What do you know about my life? That was honest. So uh, I put it off to the last day. And that morning on Friday, I went in to see this old monk. I sat next to him and, I mean, this guy was old. He had air, hair growing out of every orifice. I mean, just, he was old. He was Moses old. And, 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 and the only question I could come up with is, hey, uh, what's the secret to a long ministry? And he went through this long thing and then he said this he said George the secret to a long ministry is you have to get to know the Holy Spirit and so I took my Bible and I, and I went out to the to the little uh, backyard that had a rocking chair in it and was looking out over the Shenandoah Valley perfect blue sky not a cloud in the sky started reading every Bible verse I could find I was going to get to know the Holy Spirit that moment just like an extrovert, you know, I'm a, right now. And so, you know, I'm reading all these Bible verses and pretty soon my ADHD kicks in and I'm just kind of wandering around. <laughs> and I look up in the sky and I see an eagle. And the eagle, he's just soaring. And then I hear a whisper from the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit says to me, what do you notice about that eagle? And I, and I said to the Holy Spirit, you know what I noticed about that eagle? That eagle's not flapping his wings, not once. And the Holy Spirit said to me, that's right. That eagle just lives off the drafts of the wind. And then the Spirit of God said to me, George, you are working so hard And I don't want you to work hard. I want you to get to know me so that you live off the drafts of my wind. Grace Church, if we're going to have a faith, an up-to-date faith today, come hell or high water, we're going to have to get to know the Holy Spirit. Amen?
Let us stand for prayer. And so, Lord, um, some of us find ourselves this morning, and you are saying to us, we are tethered to our past. And today, in your marvelous grace, you want to release us. And some of us today, what is atrophied in our faith is our capacity to trust you to just like that mother duck takes care of her babies, just like Jesus said our Heavenly Father will take care of our needs, to trust you to take care of our needs. For some of us in church this morning, it is that difficult work. We're trying to figure out whether or not we trust you confidently and courageously as we consider our own mortality. Because every one of us in this room, Lord, we die. Every one of us. So, Lord, whatever's atrophied in our faith, would today you help us begin to stretch it, to grow it? Help us, God, to know that your grace is taking care of our past and that your care is taking care of our present and that, Lord, your promise is taking care of our future. And so we can live assured and confidently today as followers of Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray that simple prayer that we've prayed so many times. We pray, come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come and flood your precious children in these chairs and watching online. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Welcome and receive our worship. And we pray, God, would you do it again in us. We pray this in Jesus' name, everybody, Green said. So as always, the altar is open. We're going to sing a wonderful song. We introduced it a few weeks ago. And if you want to come down here and pray, you're invited to do that. If you need somebody to pray with you, lift a hand. Let's worship.